We're joined by Andrew Mines, a research fellow at George Washington University in their program on extremism. Good morning. Welcome to KFI, sir. Wayne, thanks for having me on. You bet. All right, let's get right into this because the, I will just tell you, I want you to tell us who, who ISIS-K is really, but I was surprised at how recent their appearance on the globe is. So ISIS-K, ISK, ISKP, I'm sure people have seen a bunch of different acronyms at this point, but uh, they are the official branch of the Islamic State in Afghanistan. They used to be Afghanistan and Pakistan, but there was a split in 2019, and now they're focused pretty much on Afghanistan. They're the official branch of the group uh, in Afghanistan, and their goal is to seek a territorial entity for the broader Islamic State movement as it pursues this kind of global caliphate that we saw in Iraq and Syria. They were founded in 2015, and they've been around for several years, actually, now. So they want they want a a a caliphate that covers the entire globe. That's right. Yeah. Every country, if they got their way, every single what we now know as different countries would all be part of a single unified global caliphate. That's what they want. That is the group's end goal, yes. They, they try to emulate this uh, kind of what they see as a, as a golden period in, in Islamic civilizations, which is a, a caliphate called the Abbasid Caliphate back in the 8th to about the 12th century. Um, at its height, it expanded across North Africa, through the Middle East, and all the way down to um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and even farther uh, southeast of that. And so their goal is to kind of emulate that and then to expand on that to eventually cover the entire world. All right. And then what is the strategic relevance of Afghanistan specifically to them in pursuing this worldwide goal? Afghanistan is the is the entire legacy of the jihadist movement, right? Things kind of start in Afghanistan. And so what ISIS as a movement is trying to do is seize on that legacy. This goes all the way back to the bin Laden days, the kind of Mujahideen um, days against the Soviets. And so um, Afghanistan has kind of this strategic narrative importance for them. They want to paint themselves as kind of like the legitimate uh, inheritors of the bin Laden legacy, of, of the older Al-Qaeda legacy, because they view the current Al-Qaeda as basically not the, the true inheritors of that legacy. And so they want to kind of seize that narrative, and Afghanistan is, is a huge, huge kind of pocket for them. Okay, now if there's a global caliphate, there has to be a leader of it, right? A caliph? Is that what happens? That's what happens, yes. Yeah. So uh, previously that was Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He's been replaced by another man we now know as al-Mawla. Uh, and my colleagues have done some great studies on that individual, the current caliph. And so he's basically seeing them through this period of relative decline. But across the globe, they've kind of pushed out into all these different branches, these different global affiliates across um, the African continent, uh, Asian continent, and elsewhere. And so right now, um, that's basically what he's tasked with overseeing. And it's a difficult period for the group, but it's also a very expansive period for the group. And what happens is that these kind of global affiliates, these global provinces, they nominate a leader to kind of lead all of the troops, all of the different groups that kind of coalesce around this guy in that area. And he's then nominated or he's then appointed by the caliph. I see. Okay. Now, their, their beef with the Taliban has to do with the scope, I guess, the, the scope of their hope? Is that really the, the main crux of the conflict between the Taliban and ISIS-K? Yeah, so the Taliban, ISK sees them as their strategic rivals. Um, they're the biggest dog in town when it comes to jihadist movements, jihadist groups. And if you want to be the biggest dog on the block, you got to go after the biggest dog. And so it's basically since their inception, ISK has gone after the Afghan Taliban, um, has poached fighters and senior leaders from their ranks, as well as the Pakistani Taliban too. And so over time, these two groups have fought each other really vehemently. Um, the Afghan Taliban, some people might not remember, but there was this period when in 2015, they were losing a lot of fighters and a lot of leaders to ISK. And so they had to clamp down on the group to basically stop all this, this this bleeding of fighters uh, over to the organization. This was an ISIS in, in Iraq and Syria was kind of on the rise, right? It hadn't even reached its kind of peak point in 2015, 2016. And so uh, they saw this potentially as disastrous for their organization as a whole. And so they had to really clamp down on ISK over time. Because the Taliban 
the Taliban would be satisfied to just run Afghanistan and have their power extend to the recognized borders of that country. And ISIS-K wants the whole planet. Exactly. Uh, the Taliban, as far as as far as they've said, are, are focused solely on the national boundaries of Afghanistan. But the ISIS movement, the Islamic State movement and ISK as a part of that, they don't even recognize national boundaries. They don't recognize the international world order. Like we were talking about, that global caliphate transcends national boundaries. And so any jihadist entity that is focused on national borders, national boundaries and doesn't kind of implement that global caliphate vision they view as heretical and they'll, they, they view as their rivals. Wow. So they think the Taliban, by virtue of only wanting to to rule in Afghanistan, are are heretics under Islam. Ideologically, there are some differences between the two organizations, too. But essentially, yes. Wow. Um, there was actually this 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 beef that was going on back in 2015 when the Islamic State first started poaching fighters from the Afghan Taliban and attacking the group. Um, where Taliban leadership actually reached out to al-Baghdadi at the time, the caliph at the time, and said, basically, you, you need to call this off. This is our place. This Afghanistan is ours, and, and we don't recognize you. And so al-Baghdadi was saying, well, I am the caliph now. Your whole emirate project, your whole project in Afghanistan is null. It's no longer valid. But the Taliban rejected him. And basically, we see after that, this feud start. I mean, I guess it sounds like the kind of thing that that it's run so deep that uh, it probably can't be solved through diplomacy between these two groups. It is very unlikely that we're going to see this solved through diplomacy. In 2020, when ISK is really at this kind of low point in its existence, they've just been hammered by the U.S.-led coalition and our Afghan partners. Um, they're in this period of relative decline. They appoint uh, uh, basically what is an urban warfare expert, this guy who's kind of got a lot of history and a lot of background in um, planning and coordinating attacks around urban areas, but also in overseeing organizations through these periods of decline. He's also tasked with giving ISK, helping them embark on this new phase of a campaign against the Afghan Taliban, of a new war on the Afghan Taliban. And so that's been his task since 2020. Man. All right. Uh, Andrew Mines, thank you so much for bringing some clarity to why these two groups are at each other's throats all the time. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you. Andrew Mines, research fellow at the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. Yeah, those guys will never uh, kiss and make up. That seems for sure.